Yeah, I thank you very much. I'm actually going to talk primarily about esophagectomy. Um, well, nothing seems to be working there. I'll try this. Okay, we've heard uh, t uh, throughout the day that uh, the enhanced recovery uh, programs for um, uh, relatively low or mid-acuity uh, operations, uh, it, seems, it seems to be quite effective. In fact, uh, when I was a fellow working with uh, Leanne, uh, we started our own, uh, what we thought was a, uh, a enhanced recovery pathway back in, the, in, in 2001, uh, where we looked at primarily foregut surgery and found that it did reduce uh, a length of stay from three to one days, reduced complications, reduced costs, as well as had excellent patient acceptance. However, we need to see if whether or not there is, uh, whether or not we can apply uh, these enhanced recovery pathway principles to more aggressive, more larger, more higher acuity surgery. Uh, we keep on going too far here, don't we? Seem to have the same issues. Um, and clearly, esophagectomy fills, uh, fulfills that, uh, that, those criteria. Uh, and in fact, if you look at here, we're still, the mouse, the mouse isn't working for me there anymore either. I'll try. All right. Okay, very good. Um, as you can see, the, uh, we're in North America, despite advances in, uh, in uh, perioperative care, we're still killing off approximately one in 10 patients. So this is, um, uh, can we apply these, uh, the principles of enhanced recovery to these really complex and high acuity procedures? Well, it's just not working, guys. So let's go back to the, uh, the dark days of esophagectomy. Now, unfortunately, the dark days are not 1950s. The dark days is unfortunately now um, uh, across North America. Um, we are still treating our patients not too dissimilarly to where the way we did 40, 50 years ago. This is sort of the, the pathway or the traditional care that is, is performed in the vast majority of places in North America. Patient, there's a routine central line insertion. There's a liberal use of intraoperative fluids. Um, uh, there's direct admission uh, to the ICU, the patient's intubated, uh, the excessive use of drains, NG tubes, chest tubes, Foley catheters, uh, oral feeding is delayed, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Some of our colleagues have gone the exact opposite direction over the past uh, five years uh, of enhanced recovery. They're not feeding their patients for a month. And length of stay, uh, they, they, we, we tend to pat ourselves on the back if we have a length of stay of, uh, of less than 14 days for esophagectomy. This is now, this is 2014. And indeed, uh, this is a patient who's on a previous pathway, uh, other sort of the traditional care. You can see he's in the ICU. He doesn't look like he's uh, particularly mobile, lots of chest tubes. And ironically, he looks uh, very similar to Franz Torek's first esophagectomy uh, a, a 100 years ago this year. There's not much difference in the way we're treating those patients. I will get through this. So, uh, unfortunately, many of the things, the rhythm in this talk is going to obviously be uh, somewhat affected by the, by the slides. I mean, a lot of these things that we're doing here are based on surgical mythology, and so we have to really, uh, um, uh, to examine every step of these, even if we're highly complex operations, operations which across North America still unfortunately have a 10% mortality rate, we have to look at every step of that procedure and hopefully um, uh, uh, address them with uh, evidence-based uh, um, uh, justification. I'm using both of these, by the way. So let's look at the, that ICU cycle. This is something that we find extremely frustrating. As surgeons, we tend to see the people on the other side of the ethernet as our opponents, but even more so, we tend to see, see the, the physicians in the ICU as our complete uh, enemies. And this is sort of part of the reason why. Uh, when patients are kept intubated from the operating theater, um, they're automatically brought to the intensive care unit. And there's gonna be no rhythm to this, this slide whatsoever, unfortunately. Um, uh, that ICU admission uh, um, uh, results in uh, increased IV sedation because the patient is intubated. They have to have lots of, uh, of, uh, of IV sedation in order to uh, keep them sedated uh, during the, uh, their, while they're intubated. And you can see that um, uh, this results in a, a drop in blood pressure. The epidural plus the, the IV sedation of propofol, of fentanyl, reduces that blood pressure. The patient, because the blood pressure is low, the, the intern does not want to extubate that patient, so the patient's kept, intubate, uh, um, kept intubated because the presses are required, and this goes on for a couple of days. This is the cycle that we see over and over and over again for patients who are sent routinely to the intensive care unit. Why is that a problem in our patient population for esophagectomies? The longer a patient's intubated, the higher rate of pneumonia, and the higher rate of an, of an asthmatic leak uh, because of the pressures that are, that are required in order to address the, the low blood pressure. 
We have to recognize in 2014, the esophagectomy is a, uh, a becoming a routine operation. This is the fastest rise in malignancy in North America, and esophagectomy is becoming more and more common. And with the increased cent uh, centralization and regionalization of esophageal surgery, there are centers that are now routinely doing 40, 50, 60, 70 cases a year. Uh, we have to recognize in anesthesia uh, that it is, if it is a routine uh, operation, we no longer need uh, central line monitoring. There should be goal-directed fluid administration, as we discussed a little bit earlier extubation in the operating theater, and if there's extubation in the operating theater and the patient's kept warm, then there's no need for the intensive care unit. The patient goes directly to the ward. And part of, the, a part of that, that concept of being able to send people directly to the ward is appropriate pain control as well as uh, making sure they're not hypothermic. So this is a study that, uh, that we've, uh, we've adopted at our inst own institution using dual, um, uh, it's from the, uh, the Mayo Clinic, and using dual epidural catheters for iralus esophagectomies. We also do this for laparoscopic and thoracoscopic approaches, and we use this routinely. Uh, this uh, study found that there was a improved pain control with two, use of two epidurals uh, and, redu and reduction of major complications by 50%. Must admit, we have found that, it's, uh, that the, main, the main issue with this is if you have one epidural, blood pressure tends to be low. If you have two epidurals, blood pressure tends to be very low. So those, things are, those are things that we have to adapt um, uh, in the perioperative period. That would be even further um, uh, complicated if the patient was kept intubated and required to have um, uh, uh, a sedation. That blood pressure would be down, down in, the, uh, in the dumps requiring uh, extensive depressors. So that's why it's very important that these patients warm enough, have good pain control, are extubated and sent straight to the recovery room as opposed to the intensive care unit. Let's look at extensive, uh, excessive use of drains in esophageal hands, uh, in the esophageal resections. You know, look at nasogastric tubes, chest tubes, Foley catheters. We talked a little bit about this earlier on, how they induce pain, they limit mobility, there's an avenue for infection. So we have to look at, is there any data uh, behind the use of drains in esophagectomy that, that can help us guide how we manage our patients? Indeed, there's quite a bit. If we look, let's look at nasogastric tubes. Now, clearly, the rationale for putting a nasogastric tube is sort of to prevent this. I'm not sure if you can see this. This is the patient's had a laparoscopic esophagectomy, and his nasogastric tube was removed, and you can see it's a very dilated stomach. Our, uh, it's, uh, it definitely clearly makes sense that we would want to have a nasogastric tube to decompress that, at least initially. Indeed, there's extensive uh, amounts of data to show that either, this is around five different, uh, actually, four, so apologies, uh, four different um, randomized controlled trials, either with a short duration of nasogastric tubes or no nasogastric tubes, all basically showing the same thing. You do not need to have a nasogastric tube for a very long period of time. Traditionally, if, if you're to pull a, the a room full of esophageal surgeons in North America, people will keep the nasogastric tube in for at least one week. Here we can show that at, 20, at 48 hours, you can remove that nasogastric tube without any significant um, uh, uh, increase in complications. What about uh, chest tubes? Now, this is, uh, I love this slide, this is from one of my colleagues. Um, uh, you can see here, the chest tubes, there's a problem with chest tubes, they're, they're hard, rigid, they, uh, they cause a lot of pain, and uh, we talked about the, the, the concept of early mobilization. Can you imagine this guy trying to go for a walk by himself? Not only does he have three uh, pleurovacs to, to, uh, to carry, they're strapped to the, they're taped to the floor, he's not moving around very much. So what we've done here is we've replaced this with, uh, with um, closed uh, suction drain, these are small, large capacity Jackson Pratt drains, allows the patient to walk around uh, uh, freely, it's much smaller and a lot less pain. What about Foley catheters? This is a study from uh, Dr. Carley's group. Again, uh, half of these patients were on our ward, uh, a good portion of them had esophagectomies, showing that we did not need to keep the Foley catheter in for the full, um, uh, for the duration of the epidural, um, uh, the duration of the epidural. If you remove them on the post operative day one, those patients actually had a reduced rate of urinary tract infection without a significant increase in, uh, in your recatheterization. So we removed the Foley catheter on the first post operative day, despite uh, having not one, but two epidurals. What about delay of oral feeding? I talked about this a little bit earlier on. Um, uh, it is tradition in North America, uh, the surgical mythology of keeping the patient NPO uh, uh, for one week. You know, we put a nasogastric tube in for one week, and just then, at, after a week, we take out the nasogastric tube and, uh, and do the contrast uh, study. Now, God forbid that, that, uh, that the seventh day turn, ha happens to be a, uh, a, a holiday, which means that patient has to wait another two days after the, uh, the, the weekend in order to get that uh, barium test. So that's exactly how we used to, used to uh, approach these patients as well. Indeed, the new trend in North America, uh, I, I really, this, is, this is the exact opposite of what we're trying to prove here, is to not even feed the patients at all for three to four weeks. Send the patients home with a feeding tube or to the hotel next to the hospital and have them come back with a barium test 
at three to four weeks. That is a trend that's passing across uh, North America. I think it's a wrong trend. Uh, because also, not only does, uh, are we able to feed our patients earlier, our barium studies don't even do anything. This is a, it's an example of a patient who's at seven days after a three-field esophagectomy when we used to do a routine standard esoph uh, esophageal um, barium studies. And you can see it's a nice, normal study. The patient didn't quite look quite uh, uh, well the next day, so we did a CT scan. And you can see here, he has a massive leak, despite having a normal barium study. So we've studied this uh, further. We looked at our own data. This is a study that just came out uh, um, uh, this past month in the Annals of Surgical Oncology, where we found that the, uh, the routine use of barium esophagrams after esophagectomy had very little bearing on the clinical management of those patients. Indeed, we're only, only able to find half of the leaks. And so what we've done is we've eliminated the barium esophagram completely and gone clinically entirely. What about the routine use of feeding jejunostomies? Uh, it is a point of, uh, of fixation obstruction, and there is a high complication rate of up to 10% with the routine use of, uh, of digenostomies. Uh, um, uh, and if the, your complication uh, rate is higher than your anastomotic leak rate, then it makes no sense to use routine feeding digenostomies. And indeed, we do not use uh, digenostomies at all. Um, rather, we start oral feeds uh, after the, uh, the nasogastric tube is removed on the second day. This is a, the a study that we, uh, that we did. I think uh, Leanne mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier. A study that we, when we implemented a first enhanced recovery uh, pathway for esophageal cancer um, in uh, 2010, we had already had standardized uh, um, orders, uh, which we had thought had re reduced uh, um, uh, some of the variability in the management of our, of our patients. But again, we had a variable amount of uh, patients going to the ICU. They may stay up to two days. Uh, there was no education um, uh, with the enhanced, re enhanced recovery pathway. We have clear education, but it's both uh, web-based as well as paper. So the patient knows what's going on. The nurses know what's, go what's going on. There's a lot of feedback and daily goals uh, that need to be achieved. We had routine use of epidural um, uh, thoracic epidurals. Now we've gone from uh, one to two epidurals. And we, again, avoid the ICU at all costs. In this, uh, beforehand, we used to have the enhanced recovery, we used to do barium swallows of post-op day five. We now no longer do them at all. Um, uh, again, avoidance of feeding uh, digenostomies. We start liquids on post-op day three, um, uh, and we try to uh, uh, target those patients to, to go home on post-op day seven. As you can see, we look over a two-year period. We had over 100 esophagectomies, approximately half before and after the, uh, the, enhanced, path, uh, the enhanced pathway was, uh, was established. And as you can see, the patient population, this, these aren't, you know, the healthy, healthy patients. These are standard esophagectomy patients, uh, primarily, primarily male, uh, 65 years old. They're old, they're the poor, I mean, uh, ASA class. A lot of them are getting neoadjuvant therapy. The majority get getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, advanced disease. So these aren't your specialized uh, selected patients. These are, these are real uh, post-esophageal cancer patients. As you can see, the operation, there's no difference between the, twi between the two. We're doing uh, a, a mix of both open and laparoscopic procedures. Approximately 20 to 25% of our patients are la uh, undergo laparoscopic resections. The rest of them are actually going large, major three-field esophagectomies, uh, left thoracal abdominal incisions, so not small incisions here. We find that, uh, again, as we, as, as we dictated in our pathway, we had no patients go directly to the ICU uh, from the uh, recovery, uh, re from the operating theater where in the traditional care we had approximately 25%. I'd say in North America, the vast majority out, uh, of centers do have at least one to two um, um, uh, days stay in the, in, the, uh, in the intensive care unit. This translated into no a change in the, um, uh, in the complication rate. We had a complication rate approximately um, uh, 60%, uh, uh, which is pretty standard for post-esophagectomy. But more importantly, we look at the ones that really count Anastomotic leak, no difference whatsoever. This is both clinical or radiographic. Mortality, there's no difference. Uh, it's very low mortality, overall less than uh, 1%. And our pulmonary complications, there's a trend for reduction in pulmonary complications in our enhanced recovery. These are very acceptable uh, uh, numbers. So despite the fact that we're feeding them earlier, despite the fact that we're taking them the NG tube out, we have no increased uh, uh, rate of, uh, of anastomotic leak and no increased rate of, uh, of uh, pulmonary complications. We look at well, um, a, the, the length of stay. Again, we're able to reduce the length of stay to, uh, to eight days. For those patients who have uncomplicated, the median length of stay was our target rate of seven days. Clearly, as you'd expect, patients who had severe complications really make a difference. The, 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 the whether or not they're on an enhanced recovery pathway or not did not dictate their length of stay, but rather the complication did. And more importantly, their, the readmission rate was, not, was very low in both arms. 
look at over the, as we adopted the, um, uh, the, uh, the pathway, we got better at it. Our nurses got better at it. We got better at it. Everyone, the patients understood a little bit more. As we, la latter phases of that study, we see there's a higher rate of patients reaching uh, um, uh, post-op day seven discharge. And Leanne already mentioned this right, right here. These are hotel costs um, showing there's a reduction. This actually translated into savings for the hospital. Of at our, our institution, we do around 60 a year. Uh, so I have not seen any of this money come back into our program, but I'm looking forward to it. I petitioned the CEO to see if he could put that back into our program. <coughs> so this is our current uh, pathway at, the, uh, at McGill in 2014. Uh, there's extensive patient education. We have both a web-based as well as a, um, uh, a paper um, uh, format which patients are given prior to the operation, well advanced to the operation, so they're able to understand what are their daily goals. Nurses already have it. There's a big board on in the in the in the, um, uh, in the um, uh, on the ward. Uh, there's routine anesthesia care, dual epidurals. We're trying to really avoid opioid uh, analgesias. No routine central lines. We limit fluids. Patients are extubated in the OR. They do not go to the ICU unless there is extraordinary circumstances. Drains. They come out of post-op day one fully. NG tube post-op day two. And the chest drain. This this patient sort of. Uh, identifies uh, what we're, how, this is a post-op day two esophagectomy. You can see uh, he highlights the drain that he does have. He's able to walk around with this. More importantly, the drain that he does not have, nasogastric tube uh, nor Foley catheter. Now, we do not do any uh, oral contrast study anymore based on the study that, we, uh, that we've already um, uh, discussed. We start uh, uh, water on day two, liquids then on day three, solids on day five, and our new current discharge is uh, day six. I don't have long-term long data for this, but we are reaching uh, that probably around 20% of our patients at this time point. Thank you very much.